Get Puck. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Get Puck podcast. Dave, Matt, and Vito here. And before we get into it, we just want to take this moment to say thank you, everybody, so very much. We've just crossed the 1,000 subscribers, and it's a huge, huge deal for us. Um, this is a passion project of ours. We enjoy talking hockey. We enjoy the Habs. Um, we enjoy throwing out our ridiculous thoughts sometimes in the ether and having you guys come back and call us out on it and just engaging with us. And it's been a really fun journey. So on behalf of the three of us, we just wanted to take this moment real fast to say thank you so much. And um, like uh, like we had mentioned, and I think Vito in a tweet wrote, we have no uh, intention of going anywhere. This, uh, this ship keeps going. So thank you so much for that, guys. Really, we do appreciate it. And with that aside, gentlemen, how you doing? Pretty good. Great. great. Pretty good. We're all, we're all great. All right. Good stuff. So let's get into some hard-hitting questions. What about you, man? No one ever asked you. You know, never. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. I'm doing okay, too. Thank Why you. should we? We don't, we don't care. We don't care, Matt, how you're doing. Absolutely I, terrible. I, I, I don't know why. You know what? I changed my mind. We're not. This ship is not moving anymore. Straight into office. the. Nah, too soon for that. Okay. So. A uh, couple things, and, and it's actually interesting. I, I had this question written from, from two weeks ago, and I think it's very topical given the fact that the Canadians went into Colorado, where they hadn't won in a decade, and they beat the Avalanche 2-1 last night. As the a Tigers team. must be upset. Yeah. So here's my question about this, boys. I wonder, is it frustrating to see the team play so well against some of the best teams in this league? and yet be in the position in the standings of where they're at? Or do you look at it as this is actually a bright thing, a bright spot on the season, and that they're able to compete against the best, and they're actually closer to being a competitive team than perhaps a lot of us think that they are? What do you think about that, Dave? I think it's a bright thing. I think it's a good thing. It's a good sign that they could compete against these teams. I think, again, you have to take it, um, you know, you have to take it lightly with, with a grain of salt, just in the sense that, um, you know, these Colorado has a, plays a ton of great teams and they, they have to size up to them. So sometimes, you know, there's games that they're going to have to put their, take their foot off the pedal, you know, if they want to survive and, and, and be at their best. And, you know, obviously those games are most likely going to be against teams like the Canadians who are below in the standings and they're going to might take them a little bit lightly. That being said, I'm not sure that that's what happened. I'm just saying that it's a good sign, but you can't just say like, hey, look, there there you go. They can compete with the Stanley Cup contenders. Perfect. They're a playoff team next year. No, obviously not. But I think it is a good sign that they can compete that they rise to the occasion. You know, it was an emotional game for Marty St. Louis' return. It seems like the team was lifted by that as well. So kudos to them and, and, and they pulled it off. And I think it's a good sign going forward. I think that if they, you know, as much as the tankers and the people who want to see this team fail and, and get that first overall pick, if this team was getting below with, with the with the players they have now, like their core is pretty much quote unquote in place right now, playing they have a good core there. If they were getting blown out every night, they'd be a huge cause of a con for concern. You know, I don't think anybody thought they'd be a playoff team, but you wanted to see them compete a little bit here or there, and I think that they've proven that. So to me, it's a good thing. Take it with a grain of salt. Obviously, it's not the it's not the greatest thing in the world, but it is a good thing. It's a positive thing, and and you want to see more of those, and it makes the games for fans more exciting down the stretch to know that hey, they might put up a fight against these teams as opposed to just rolling over. Well said, sir. Vito, you know, do you echo that sentiment, or you uh, you hate this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't hate it. But I mean, at the start of the season, we did say that we think we thought that we would see some progression from the Montreal Canadiens. And while the standings don't exactly reflect that, there is progression. If you watch the games, they're playing they're playing well. If you look at even their 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 stat line in the standings, they've got sixty six points in seventy one games. Um, last year, they finished the season sixty eight and eighty two. So you you can see that there's progression there. It doesn't matter the teams that they're facing or who they're beating at the times that they're beating them. But you want to see this. You want to see some compete from them. Uh, you want to see some light at the end of the tunnel of this of this long rebuild. Um, you're starting to see some of the kids uh, become the the pros that you know uh, we were hoping that they would become. Slavkovsky is has been such a bright spot uh, in the second half of the season. Suzuki is having a career year already and is is on, is on the verge of 30 goals. Um, like, there's so many good things to take away from the season, even though they are 
a bottom five, six, seven team th uh, this year. So um, beating Colorado, to Dave's point, take with a grain of salt. It doesn't mean that they're always going to beat Colorado. Colorado is, a, is an elite team. Um, you know, they're a Stanley Cup contending team. But they played very, Montreal played very well uh, last night. And it's, it's not Montreal's fault if Colorado didn't fully show up. Now, to that point, too, Ranton and then hit the post a few times. That could have changed the whole, the whole game if even one of those would have gone in. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to see it. And, and when you look at it, even the other teams that, for people who are like pro tank, the other teams that were supposed to win won too. So Montreal pretty much stays around the same spot. And they just we got to see some entertaining hockey at the same time. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll agree exactly with you guys. I'll take it a step further. I think this is possibly the best case scenario that could be happening for this team, given where they're at in the rebuild. You're looking at a team that's capable of competing with the best. To Dave's point, if they were getting blown out every time they went up against the Colorados, the Dallases, the, the, the Vancouver's, which is weird to still say, but whatever, the top, top tier teams in the league right now, yeah, you'd be like, oh, okay, they're like, three, four more years for sure. They got to finish at the bottom of the standings at least two, three more years, get better picks, and, you know, then we can talk. I think the fact that they're able to put up this level of fight, um, and they and they have, I don't know if it's the most, but they have a tremendous amount of games, and this was echoed many times in the media, that they've only lost by one goal. And the and the argument is if they, can, if they could get next year or the following year uh, another player on the team who can bring in you know, close to 30 goals, how many of those games could they have won? And how much closer are they to the to the to to getting a playoff berth? Oh, don't forget so, that, they, you know, they went to overtime a lot so far this year. And they and, and, and get that extra there's a lot of, as well. There's a lot of uh, loser yeah, points. for there. sure. For sure. So, so to me, I'm oh. looking at this. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a, a young team, a very young team, putting it up, putting their Dukes up against the best and, and, and showing that, that they're not that outmatched. They're not in the same class. I'm not suggesting that, but they're close. They're not they're, really. They're, they're not. They're and not, and okay, they get the benefit. Hold on, but they get before the benefit people, also of the pick. That to me is what makes on. it the, the cherry before on top. Before people misconstrue what you mean by close, they're just closer than what people think. Not close to being playoff contenders. All I, I guess. Well, well, yeah. There's that's, people who are going to watch this said. episode uh, and they're going to be like, "They're close. They're not close. They're just going to rip you to shreds." And I don't no, mind. I'm them not saying this. they're close I'm to okay. Colorado. I'm, I'm saying that they're closer in the the getting to being a competitive they're, they're, they're team they're than maybe people yes. think they are. They're they're a lot better than people think. And to think they're they're doing this without their two C. And okay, so I mean, do you want to just say everything I want to say? Is that what's happening here? I'm not yeah. in your mind. I don't want to be. Well, that it in sounds this. like you're in my mind because that's what I'm saying too. Look at what they're capable of doing, and they're and they're not even using everything that they already have. Forget the fact that they're going to go out and likely spend this summer for the first time in years and try to bring a big piece in, given all the assets that they have on defense to move and the picks and everything. And another top, let's call it seven pick. And who knows what kind of finagling that Hughes and Gorton are going to do to maybe move up there to secure uh, a forward. So that, you know, that that's another thing. There's just a lot of 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 good that that when I look at it, I know a lot of people are frustrated. They're like, oh, my God, they beat Colorado. And, oh, they got two points and why and this and that. I think you got to look at it the other way. Of course, grain of salt and blah, blah, blah. But I think it's better. It's 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 probably just it's a it's a it's a better personal feeling for all the fans. If you kind of try your best to look at a glass half full instead of half empty in this regard. I'd rather it's be sort in of this like my situation. sentiment on this. I'd rather be in this kind of situation and know that, okay, there's progression and you can see the light at the end of the tunnel and you can see the team moving up slowly versus somebody like the auto, like a team like the Ottawa Senators where on paper they should be a lot better than where they're at in the standings. And all of a sudden you're looking and, and questioning whether another rebuild should happen. Yeah, that's, I think, a very fair sentiment too. And and so and so along along the wavelength you mentioned, I thought it was interesting that you just said this because it leads into my next question. You said it's the bright spots. You said Suzuki career year, Slavkowski most points for a teenager in a season, second time now he's on a game point streak, bright spot. But you didn't mention the third guy on that on that line, and that brings me to my next question, gentlemen. Caulfield, a lot of people, a lot of people disappointed when they think about Caulfield this season. They had expectations that this is a guy who should be floating around when he's healthy, 
40 goals year in, year out. 35 is like an okay season. So they look at what he's got on paper this year, and they're saying this is a disappointing season. Versus you have others who are sensibly looking at and saying, look at the player and look how more rounded his game is. He has now developed the playmaking sort of capabilities to his game in addition to his goal-scoring prowess. So he sacrificed the offense a little bit, but became a more well-rounded player. And it's better. This is a better thing for him, better thing for the team. I ask you this. You just spoke a lot, so I'm going back to Dave to start. Are you <laughs> disappointed when you think about Caulfield in the season? Dave, who has expectations, always so low, so I know where this is going. But anyways, or do you look at it the other way and say, nope, this is this is good. This is a good season, and, and progression was made. For the record, my expectations aren't low. They're realistic. I think that a, a lot of people <laughs> get swiped. I don't get swiped into hype trains and, and stuff like that. And I think I was very clear in saying that expecting Cole Caulfield to jump to 40, 50 goals was absolutely I, – I was on record. Last year, beginning of this year, I screamed it from the rooftops. Like, that's not going to happen. It's just unrealistic to expect a guy like that to do it. And there was nothing in his play – other than these spurts that really, I mean, okay, you got a good second half of the season, 26 goals last year, fine. But again, there, there was, there was, there's signs in his play that he, he wasn't going to progress like that this, this season. And so I'm not disappointed. I think it's easy to be disappointed though, because 20 goals, I mean, that doesn't even crack the top 100 goal scorers in the NHL. Uh, he's playing on the top line that's rolling right now, and he's still not scoring. He has he has one goal in his last seventeen games. He's he, he, that's before he scored a few games ago. He hadn't scored since Valentine's Day. Like that, to me, is inconsistent. And that to me is and and again, I warned about this. He was bad under Duchamp for that first half of that season. Then Saint Louis came, and then all of a sudden he was fixed. And I said that shows a streakiness. That and it's a bad habit and it's a bad tendency. And last year too, he had he had some bad times, uh, a little bit of bad times. Not so much last year because he had a very shortened season. But we didn't get to see the second half of the season. And now we're starting to see, eighty-two game season, he has twenty goals, and one in his last seventeen. When his team his roll, line is rolling, it's not as if he's with scrubs. He's he's playing with the guys he's supposed to be playing. Is his game more rounded? Absolutely. Again. Well, how many assists does he have in that same time period? Do we have that on on offhand? I can check that. I mean, I, I, I'm all, not 100 percent sure. All I can all I can say is that right now he's on a higher point per game pace. He's on the highest point per game pace of his career right now. Yeah. Okay. I mean that that okay. that's fair. He's so, like four years, three years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he, he's he's three years in. I don't I don't really count the first year because the first year was ten games. He just he came in late and he was like right after uh, you know yeah. the whole the whole thing. So. I think the reason why people got caught up with Caulfield scoring, potentially scoring 50 goals is because he was on a 43-goal pace last year, even though it was a shortened season for him because of a shoulder injury. The other thing to, to consider, I'm not trying to make I'm not gonna try making excuses, but maybe there, there there is the shoulder injury that he it still takes time to to fully heal from. Uh, but he is a, a more well-rounded player. He's on a 65 point pace this year, um, which again is the highest point per game pace. So yeah, and goal scores in general tend to be streaky. You don't, you know, if the goal scores weren't streaky, they'd, they'd all have eighty-two goals a, a season. So yeah, but goal, goal scores goals. also tend to score. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. It's twenty goals, guys. Like there's a hundred more, yeah. one hundred four people in the league that has more more goals than him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like goal scores. Tend I, to be I, I'm just, I'm happier, but I am when it comes to Caulfield or whatever. I'm happier that he, his his game is getting better, and he's just not that one guy who you know you're feeding. You're feeding the shot to when he's going to rip it and be a, a Mike Camilleri of sorts, you know. Uh, and I'm using him as an example because he played for the Montreal Canadiens. But he's not just that one-dimensional player. He, if he's developing into something, uh, you know, a player that can do or could play many aspects of the game, but also pot you goals, then great. Um, I still see him as being a guy who can potentially flirt with 40 goals throughout his career uh, in a season be more of a consistent mid-30 guy. But if he happens to hit 50, great. But I, I, I see him as, as a guy that will, um, will be more of a mid-30s uh, goal-scoring type of guy on a consistent basis in the future. I also do think that he would probably benefit being a guy who's on the second line at some point rather than uh, being a guy who's playing the tough matchups against the tougher opponents night in and night out. 
It's not to say that he can't do it, but I just think there'll be more opportunities and more openings for him if he is on the second line getting, you know, get it, playing against uh, not less, not weaker competition, but lesser competition, so to speak. I mean, I like your optimism. Uh, a, a regular <laughs> goal, goal, goal guy is, is that to me is a bit high uh, from what we've seen so far. Yeah, we saw Brendan Gallagher do it. You're telling me that's, and I, yes, there were garbage goals and he went to the dirty areas and whatever, but I mean, You've seen players score thirty goals and be thirty goal scorers, and you know and I'm play similar goals. You're saying mid thirties to mid forty goals on a consistent basis. Like that's a whole different. You know, you're talking you said season, 50. After season after season after season. No, multiple times no. you said, oh, you know, he uh, get to close to fifty and up to fifty. I, I never no, said. 50 I never said. 40. I never said close to fifty. I said flirt oh, with forty. Well, you have to do some research here. Turn the tapes back. You Where mentioned yeah. oh, could, could I, be up. To I said 50. He, I could see him being a consistent mid thirties and yeah. flirt with forties. No, but that's I never said now. fifty. I okay. said he was on pace for, for forty three last, goals year. last year. Yeah. So I can understand why people got caught up with that. I can't hey. have to explain myself again. Put Why your crazy eyes home? away. What do you hold on a second here? I'm just saying Jeez. that you mentioned that, and then in the same breath, a minute later, you mentioned that you like him better on the second line. No, it's, it's not How a good sign. Up 40 goals on the second line. You're not even listening to one of the people on this podcast. It's not a good sign. <laughs> and again, uh, I mean, to be fair, like we still haven't seen it, it's great that this line's rolling. Well, I don't want to be pessimistic or anything, but we haven't seen them when they're a team that people circle on the calendar because it's going to be a tough matchup and they put their best guys and they say, you got to hound this guy. He's up. Like we haven't seen that yet. Right. They kind of still in my, I'm a huge believer in this. I'm a huge, huge believer in this. And the and it's the reason, I mean, I think it's been proven by stats that that non-playoff teams have such in the past have had such good high guys who could score. And then they go to a playoff team or they get traded and they never put up those seasons again. It's because, you know, they're, they're not, they don't face the same level of scrutiny that you would if you're a, a playoff team and, and you're competing day in and day out. I am a firm believer in that. And I don't care what anybody could come at me and, and, and come at me. <laughs> I, I've been proven. I, I could tell you countless times where I look at a guy and I'm like, this guy is not going to live up to this contract. And that's why so many times players don't live up to their contracts. It's because of these situations where they're just they're let loose in a scenario that's the pr- ideal for them. But when it comes time to it, you know, when, it, when when they get buckled down on and, and, and you get your top guys covering you because you're that guy who's scoring 14 goals in, you know, well, 21 games. But Dave, you just said it there, right? So, so how much of or the, the lack of goal scoring from Caulfield can you attribute to the fact that is it the player or is it because players of other teams have studied tape and see how the play's going, how the pass is kept going to Caulfield and what, you know. Yes. Big time. But, but that's that, a huge fact. But, they know him now. Score, but my point is goal scores score despite that right austin matthews gonna you're not telling me nobody is 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 circling austin matthews and saying okay this is how you stop him this is how you stop ovechkin from scoring this is how you stop like they still find a way to score and that's what coffee has to learn to do in this league i'm not saying that once that happens it's going to stop i think you're seeing that point now people saw cold cold coffee coming and now they plan game plan for him just a little bit more still not to the level that you'll see when the canadians are contenders and that's why you're seeing the dip in play, which is that, fine. But you've hmm. got to overcome it. And I'm not sure we've seen that from Cole Caulfield yet. Well, that's why I, I'm. That's why I'm thinking that his the way he's changing his game is like kind of, in one way, take a step back to move a step forward, to move two We're steps open. forward, and We're another. And in the meantime, still produce and be a uh, be a threat of some kind and be a productive player by rounding out the rest of his game and you know, being a bit more dynamic versus being the guy who just comes in on the left and rips a shot or gets gets fed a one-timer and being one-dimensional. And that's why I'm happy to see that his game is being a bit more rounded out versus being that guy that, they, you know, just pa- try to stream on a pass to and get him to rip it. The one thing that Cole Caulfield did have before, <clears throat> and he still has it, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna find it again, is being able to, when he does rip a shot, is find those places that the typical player is not able to, to find you know those 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 holes in a goalie that that you look and say how the heck did he see that and Caulfield was always good at that and he will find that again you know so I'm not I'm not concerned about uh, about him being able to score goals that way he will do it it's just the now it's good to know that he's going to be a multi-threat player versus just a single threat player uh, yeah overall for the player it's I think coming back to the question I think it's a it's a it's a, a success 
story for progression on the player. Obviously, it's met with a tinge of disappointment because of that main storyline last year before he got injured. All that we had as fans was, is Caulfield going to get 40? Remember that? That whole thing? And he was he was on fire. And then he goes down and then everybody was like, oh, okay, fine. When he, when he rehabs and gets back, right back to it. We all know you don't get back right away from an injury. There's always no. something that's different. I'm not saying that that suddenly is going to make him, instead of being a potential 40-goal scorer in the future, now max 25. I don't think so. I think he's healthy again. I think it's very important to note, like you mentioned, that people, players, teams, are definitely putting a stronger clamp on him because he's not getting away with what he was getting away with that other season. There's, there's, there, and, and the Habs don't have a lot of players to circle. So you go hard on Suzuki, you go hard on Caulfield and Slavkovsky now a bit. So that's that's it. The rest of them, they're kind of thing. And that's why you got Joel Armia uh, acting like a like a superstar out there scoring left, right, and center because no one's really paying attention to him anymore, for sure, as an example. But I think the another thing to take away, which has been reported, I think it's it's been actually reported, Martin St. Louis came out and said he wanted all of his guys to become more rounded players, all of them. That means, by definition, you're going to notice the majority of them taking a step back. For guys like Suzuki, the irony is he was already very defensively sound. And so now he got to kickstart his offensive game a bit more and went the other direction. But when you look at a guy like Caulfield, where he was, you know, give me the give me the puck, I'll rip the shot, I'll rip the shot. Now you're finding that he's finding passing lanes. And to your point, you're finding more threats on the ice. And I think he has several assists in the span that he didn't get a goal there. So the points are coming, nine. like you mentioned. Nine assists in those seven. Nine assists. Nine assists in 16 games? 17. 17? Okay. Could be yeah. better, but but it's not terrible. Still, still 35 still, assists in the season. It's still it's still a good season. And and he's still very young. I mean, I think we're all gonna say the exact same thing. Would we all love to have seen him get close to 40 this year? But of course. But of course. But is this already the moment where you look at him and say, wow, we were we were we were hoodwinked. He we got sold a player who should have 40 goals year in and year out, and he's not going to come close to that? I don't think so. I think that we're still a few years away from seeing what he's going to be as an average. Yeah. So no, not disappointed. My answer, not disappointed. Love to know what the people listening think. Are you disappointed in the Caulfield season? Yes or no? Were your expectations very high, or is this meeting the expectations and you're more satisfied with the progression as the hockey player more than the goal scorer? Let us know in the comments as we move on to the next sort of question. Um, we can do one of two things here, because I don't think we're going to get to both of them. We can talk about the draft gentleman, or we can talk about Ryan Bacher. Where do you want to go? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Mixing Dealer's it up choice. on you. Dealer's choice. Dealer's choice? Dealer's choice. Okay. Let's talk Ryan Bacher. Uh, it's a good choice because we're, we're going to have a lot of draft talk. Though, yeah, we're going to have a lot of draft coming up. Let's, talk, let's talk Ryan Bacher. I tough? know, unfortunately, we missed last week. We were going to put on an episode, and he's already played a couple games, and it has went, I think, has been recorded uh, and documented as to say it went as good as it can go for him. The games were won. He scored goals. Things are great. Lovely. Fantastic debut. But let's... Let's just, because we didn't get the chance, let's just bring it back just a tinge, okay? There was a comment. I, I, I'm i sure maybe one of you might remember, and if not, I'm sure people listening will remember exactly who said it. But it was it was out there. It was said, and it's from somebody in the media. I think it was the French media. And they had mentioned or posed the question, is Ryan Bacher a bust? And this got me thinking, how in the world, how can traditional media guys who do this for a living, Minus the obvious clicks and views and the nonsense. But to come out with a straight face and say, is this 18-year-old who has never played a professional game in his life before a bust? H how, how does that happen? And, and, and is this just part of the machine? Should, should fans, this is my real question, should fans tune this out? Go listen to your traditional media. Go out there and do what you want to do. But when you hear statements like this, just in one year, out the other, because it doesn't merit it. They're just looking to get reactions. Because there's no way, right? There's no way that a legitimate, real, sensible, hockey person could have asked that question and actually meant it. This is what right? happens when you have a constant need for content. 
Okay, this is what happens. You're going to get the clickbait. You're going to get the people saying outrageous statements because you just need to stand out, right? You need and and probably I I, I don't remember I I don't remember who said it and I don't know who said it, but most the most likely scenario is that they got exactly what they wanted. It, it probably circulated throughout X and it circulated throughout social media and people were talking about it. They probably spoke about it on on the radio here or there on TV. Maybe it was a point. And this guy got the attention. Uh, he deserved, or or a woman. I don't know who said it, so I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say. I'm trying it, to look it's, it up now. It, we live in a world where you have to have a hot take, or you have to have a take that's different than everybody else. And I think it's easy to look at a guy like Reinbacker. I mean, look, every if, when when some everyone's saying, "Hey, this guy's going in a good direction. This guy, look at this. I can't wait till he comes. He's going to be." And then it's easy to just bet on the bet on the opposite. And if and if it works, you're a genius. If Reinbacker's a bust, that guy will come back to you three years later and said, "I called this uh, three years ago." And if not, it's forgotten about. No one's going to remember. I, I think, to, just to add some context, I think, if I remember correctly, the context of it was that it's not necessarily that they're calling him a bust. They're questioning whether he's a bust in comparison to the people that were drafted ahead of him. Well, that, you should but never... That doesn't make any sense. You'd have to you'd have to judge it by the people behind drafted behind him if he's a bust. That, that, it doesn't work for the beforehand. Obviously, everyone drafted beforehand, it doesn't even matter. And, and even it's still... Never, and even still, what does it matter if the people after him or before him become superstars? What if he ends up becoming a top four steady defenseman and he was a good pick? Could you have gotten the other guy? Sure, but does that necessarily make him a bust? No, the bust uh, thing is stupid. I, I do remember reading a lot, quite a lot on X about people who are saying temper your expectations with David Reinbacker. He's not going to be a flashy guy that's going to come in and light the storm. Yes. Although he did, to be fair, in his first game with Laval. <laughs> but obviously you're not, you can't expect that every game. And, and I think if fans expect that going forward, I think that's silly of them. But look, I mean, the guy hasn't even touched base here. Like how, how can you ever question anything about him? It's okay to temper your expectations, but the to insinuate that he's going to be a bust or he's not going to live up to his t top uh, top five pick, Th that's stupid in my opinion. And therefore, I think that you should just you should tune these people out a little bit. It's okay to to, to see these these crazy takes and laugh at them with your friends, but don't take them for granted and definitely don't go repeating them as your own op opinions because that's going to make you look foolish. The way, yeah, the way. <laughs> The way I so see it, it, it's way too early to call anybody a bust at the age of 18, 19 years old, especially when they were drafted that high. Because They haven't even played in the NHL yet. They haven't played in the NHL. You're already calling them a bust before they ever get started, especially we all know that defensemen take a little more time than, than, than let's say, forwards to get to round out their game and develop. Uh, you know, when they drafted Reinbacher, they knew what they were, what they were potentially getting in this guy uh, and in this kid. And... And from I, I'm the kind of guy that I love to look at comparables, right? I like to see what players uh, think about him, what uh, you know, what sites, uh, certain analysts and scouting uh, gurus uh, think about the player, and, and right. so on. And when you look at players who have either played with Ryan Bacher, uh or who have played against them, they always use the same players as comparables. The most recent one actually was a bit new. I didn't expect that one, and albeit I will not complain, was he's he he, play, he has like. A Devin Taves style of game, but with more offensive potential. So you're looking at a guy who does the little things right and, and is very coachable and and very uh, you know defensive minded, two way, but can also produce offensively. And then you know some have compared him to a, a Pietrangelo. His game is very reminiscent to a Pietrangelo. So while you could have the Michkovs of the world and all these other players that may may be very high end talent and might produce at a very high level, there's not that many right-handed defensemen who you can slot in in the future or that you can look and say could be a, th a future top pairing guy and is and is a guy that you can what they're saying could potentially be the kind of type the type of defenseman you need for deep playoff runs but to ca call him a bust at 19 years old and he hasn't skated a single game in the nhl other than training camp of course uh is is ridiculous is really see this kid in, in five six seven years from now and if he's yeah. if he's become i don't know i don't want to name drop a player and, and and like crap on their career but if he becomes nowhere close to being some of the comparables you heard or, or anything of the player or he doesn't even make it to the nhl then you can call him a bust but a bust is a very big word to use it's I, a I, big I, label yeah. to put on somebody who has played one uh, no, has played what two pro games 
Well, that's it. And I and I think realistic I ended up finding it is it was Jean Charles for, for, for TVA. You can go look it up. That's where it came from. And again, to Dave's point, yes, it's clicks and there's you need content and content, be it good or bad, gets you the clicks and gets you the, the engagement. Well, it's click, click it's click, click, click in theater articles. I, I saw him defending the and I like telling people saying well, you guys are well, just so, reading the headline and not reading the actual article. Well, and that's fair. So that's kind of what I just skimmed through very fast. And ultimately the fact is it was a clickbaity title. That's really the problem, but that's what a lot of people take. Realistically, what he should have said, or what what the what the 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 conversation piece should have been, without getting too much into it, was it's it, David Reinbacher was probably the wrong pick for them to have picked at that point. They should have taken X player or Y player, Michkov or whatever. Right? That's where he's going with. It, he, they shouldn't have taken him. Not that he's necessarily going to be a bad player, but in his estimation, this goes all the way back to the draft. Yeah. People are, are still not happy with the pick. Whatever. That's a different story. But you can't come out, and that's my biggest beef about it. And again, right, Montreal is such a hotbed for hockey. And it's it's a it's one of the main places in the NHL where even in the offseason and in the dog days of summer, people still talk about the Canadians. They're still talking about hockey, which means this conversation will go on indefinitely. And, and I find it crazy that this kid, who is a kid, is coming here, was excited to be here, and after all this time from the draft and everything that happened at the draft and everything that came out and all the, the memes and the things that were said, we're still talking about, oh, well, is he going to I, I, I think what's going to calm on, that man. I think that what's going to calm that down a little bit. I'm not saying there won't be people that are going to say things, but it's going to calm down a little bit is the fact that you're seeing what Slavkovsky is doing now. A lot of people were already... Talking well, different kind of player, but yeah, different kind of player. But the, the concept is it was a high pick first overall versus a fifth, right? I get that, but it was a high pick. And now, you know, you saw Sofkowski, people were questioning he's a bust, he's a bust. And now, you know, you see him coming out, it's like, be patient, give it time. These are young kids. This Montreal hasn't really been in this type of re full rebuild position probably ever, you know what I mean? So, like, just l give it, give it the time it needs, make your assessment and judgment. I say give every player that's been drafted, unless they come out right away, about five years. Three to five years. That's what you give. I just love, on a final thought, I think, thank goodness, his first two games were good games. Because <laughs> I think this would have been amplified like a million times worse if he showed up and he looked like a fish out of water. It's he, it's because people were looks good, we're seeing man. A, we're seeing a stat I know it's the AHL. Team. But he no, I good. know, but they were seeing what was going on overseas, and that was a bad team. People, for people who don't follow, it was a really, really bad team. And he was a kid who were, they were he was playing 20 to 25 minutes a game, playing on the worst team in that league. Agreed. And to be fair to Jean Charles, one last final note is that they often don't write their own headlines. So he might have been, uh, you know, so, somewhere the producer or something or other. Okay, but I'm sure he out. liked. Yeah, I'm sure he liked the yeah. traction that it got. Because if it was a big problem, and if you're putting words in someone's mouth, you'll take the article down or you'll make the changes, I'm sure, before it goes to print. Listen, I'm not getting into that, but realistically, we're very happy for what we're seeing for him. And we hope that the Laval Rocket make the playoffs and they go on a run and we get to see more of him do what he's doing. And then you know what? Next year, we can start talking in the summer. We're not going to get into it now. In the summer, we can start talking about what the top six is going to look like. Can I he crack the top six? Go. Oh, we'll see. We'll he's see what he can do over the summer. I'll say but it right it's going to be great. Again, just want to come what, uh, back to it one last time. Guys, thank you so very much for that uh, for, for getting us over that 1,000 subscriber mark. That really means a tremendous amount to us, and we're really, really proud of it. And we really want to thank everybody for taking the time and hitting that subscribe button and, and maybe sharing this amongst some friends who, who enjoy listening to the content. And as always, we love interacting with you guys. Leave comments in the videos or on, or on X, Twitter, whatever um they really on anything that we said what your feelings on Caulfield are um what your stance is on on the season is it a, still frustrating if you're really team tank that they're winning these really you know games that they had no business winning in on paper or is this a good thing like we were describing and this is actually leaning more towards a a, a healthy good visual uh sign of progression for the team let us know in the comments and as as always this was get pucked